This is the largest water rocket I've ever made so far. Like most water rockets, it comprises a pressure chamber which is partially filled with water and pressurised with compressed air, before being ejected out a nozzle at launch, producing a substantial amount of thrust. It also features a parachute deployment system to ensure I can get it back in one piece and fly it again. The Gamma 4 is made of several sections of spliced soda bottles, attached to one another with pressure tight connectors, giving the rocket a total height of 1 meter and 54 centimeters. This is extremely similar to my previous rocket, the Gamma 3, which was made of one spliced bottle assembly with a single bottle attached to the top. If you'd like to see a more detailed breakdown of the build process and my original large water rocket, I made a video about it a couple of years ago. But as a real quick rundown, I made these splice sections by cutting the bottom of two identical soda bottles, before dipping one of them in a few centimetres of boiling water. This shrunk the bottom portion of one of the bottles so they could be slid together. I glued these segments with a healthy amount of expanding liquid nails. These splices can hold upwards of 100 psi. I made two of these spliced sections for this rocket, before adding an additional regular bottle on the top, giving the Gamma 4 a total pressure chamber volume of 6.25 litres. Next, the three large fins were cut from a sheet of coroflu and glued on with epoxy. This is the same material often used on roadside election posters. In terms of recovery, I simply repurposed the deployment mechanism of my previous rocket. I also removed its rail buttons for this new rocket since the Gamma 3 sprung a pretty significant leak in its spliced section, meaning the rocket would need to be entirely rebuilt to be useful again anyways. Again, to understand the whole process of how this deployment mechanism works, I recommend you go watch my previous video featuring it, as well as my video where I directly compare the performance of water rockets and solid propellant rockets, a concept that I couldn't find explored anywhere else on the internet. That video in particular goes into all the detail of the development of my water rockets from the beginning. The recovery system is an electronic deployment system, which at its core features an Adafruit Feather microcontroller. The system uses an accelerometer to detect the initial acceleration at launch, and a barometer which confirms this by reading altitude. The parachute itself is housed in a small compartment with a spring made of a section of pet plastic. A simple door encloses the parachute, which is held down by a servo, before a programmable amount of time passes, at which point the servo actuates and the parachute is sprung out of the rocket at a decent rate of speed. The deployment timing can be programmed by a physical 3-digit binary encoder on the breadboard. This board also features a micro SD card, which records all readings from the sensors throughout the flight. Every time this LED blinks indicates another data packet recorded by all sensors. Moving on to the launch pad infrastructure and how this rocket is actually pressurized. This rocket uses pre-existing host connector design, since they already can hold substantial pressure and mean less development on my end. The nozzle of the rocket is a 9mm internal diameter 3D printed host connector from US Water Rockets. A hose end connector is fitted to the nozzle which leads to a short section of regular garden hose. On the other end of this hose is a custom adapter for a bike pump. For the launch pad itself, the rocket is guided by a 2 meter 1010 aluminium extrusion section thanks to the aforementioned rail buttons. This rail is secured to a large tripod. This is pretty standard practice for even pyro rockets. The release mechanism functions thanks to some string and a pulley system which converts the horizontal motion of me pulling on the string to vertical motion which lowers the hose fitting which has a spring in it and releases the rocket. For this rocket, I've also added a safety key which fits below the hose fitting meaning the rocket cannot launch until it's removed, which I found out was a problem with the Gamma 3. Now, like all good engineering projects, it was time for some static tests.
With all of those static tests complete, I decided to perform one more 80 psi air only static test a few days before a launch attempt to ensure the pressure chamber remained void of leaks. Since, for reasons that will become obvious soon, it had been a while since I'd done those last static tests you just watched. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a recording of it, only the aftermath, but this is a lesson to never underestimate the power of compressed air. What happened was that I used several layers of tape instead of a bolt to hold down the rocket, and the result speaks for itself. With that out of the way, it was time for the first launch attempt, and I'll let you see how that went. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Oh, go. Oh. Okay, obviously something went very wrong with this flight. This launch was done at 80 psi with around 2 litres of water. It may seem like the rocket simply didn't have enough thrust, and so didn't have enough altitude for the parachute to deploy. However, that isn't quite accurate. The main Gosh. issue was the fact that the rocket got hung up on the launch rail due to excessive friction at launch. This meant most Gosh. of the energy was wasted before the rocket even took flight. Now, I was using commercially available rail buttons with the appropriate launch rail, so I wasn't sure where the real issue was. So I consulted some water rocket experts online, and they suggested using a silicone-based lubricant in the groove of the rail, which works well with aluminium. With this new important knowledge in mind, I had to do some quick repairs on the rocket to prepare it for flight again, notably replacing the nose cone section since that took the brunt of the impact. And with that, a few months later, I headed out for the second launch attempt. And if you're enjoying this video so far, do consider subscribing since around 97% of my viewers aren't. Thanks. Almost there. Surely that's close. Eighty. Eighty.
All right, recovery. Got caught in the rail again. Oh no! It's bees. How do I get away from them? Just land. No. It's attracted to the sound. Just land. Okay. Oh, it's gonna. Oh, it's gonna be all chewed up. No, the bees, man. Rip. How do I? I don't want to land on me. No, 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 just land it far away. It's. A, it sounds like a wasp to them, so they don't like it. And they'll disappear. Stop. Do you need help? Me guts. It's covered in blood and goo. Blech. Rough landing. Terrible. Let me go really check it out. Landing. It's a nose first landing, like I was trying to avoid, but we'll go ahead and disarm it. I think it was too much water on it, so you think that was going amazing. So, landing nose first. It looks like all it did was just move the masking tape, which is why it's good to use like a low tolerance tape. So, just. Yeah, but. Fins slight look fine. On the bottle. Oh, there's a slight crack in it as well. Right there. Crack in the nose. Case. Yeah, that was the nose first landing. But other than that, that was successful. Came out pretty unscathed. Yeah. So now it's the question: Do we want to do another flight? Right here. How does it fly like how was the flight time so fast? That was a pretty solid landing though. The nose cone's not straight at all. No. So things worked a lot better on the second attempt. I had three successful launches and recovered the rocket on all attempts. 
This is evidence that the silicone-based lubricant was definitely the way to go to avoid friction at launch. However, on the first launch, despite the lubricant, you can still see the rocket get held back on the rail momentarily before accelerating after it cleared the launch pad. This is why on the other two launches, I added a final generous amount of lubricant just before launch. And this seemed to have solved this issue. This leads me to believe that there is an issue with how the rail buttons are secured to the rocket itself. And despite gliding freely unpressurized, perhaps the change in shape as the rocket pressurizes causes the rail buttons to slightly misalign. Or maybe there is too much flex in the rocket's structure at launch, which could also cause this misalignment. The only other small issue on these flights was the parachute's shock cord placement on the rocket's body. Ideally, the rocket would come down perfectly horizontally to minimize any damage on impact. However, the rocket was coming down nose first, slowly damaging the nose cone assembly after each recovery. It's not as simple as tying the shock cord around the center of mass of the vehicle, since the large fins at the rear of the rocket will cause the rocket to tilt down into the airstream. This is obviously an easy fix, since I just need to ensure the shock cord is mounted further back for the next launch attempt. Also, huge thanks to Remy, who made a lot of the cool camera angles possible for this launch attempt. And with that, thank you for watching this video. Let me know if you enjoy water rocket content, since there's a lot more I can explore. For example, I've yet to experiment much with adding soap to the water to improve performance at this scale, so it could be the topic for an experiment in the future. But thank you all for tuning into this video. Until next time, see ya!